The Chicago Bears beat the Houston Texans on Sunday, but it doesn't fully feel like it. We're going to talk about all of the positives from this game that the Bears can take moving forward, but we're also going to need to start this difficult conversation about what's going on with Justin Fields. You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter at CoxSports1. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Bears. You can like Locked On Bears on Facebook. You can join the Locked On Bears Facebook group for even more Bears talk. And make sure you hit that subscribe button on the Locked On Bears YouTube channel to keep up with all of our video podcasts as well. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today and hopefully every day on the show today. We'll get into this Bears running game, leading the way. The team going 281 yards on the ground and two scores, really pushing this team ahead for the victory and how this running game has come together and what it kind of means for this Bears offense moving forward. We're going to have to talk about Justin Fields looking pretty broken right now. We'll try and assess what's going on and what more we need to see, what the Bears can try and do to help him to get things back on track moving forward. And we'll wrap up with this Bears defense generating turnover in there. Roquan Smith looking back to Pro Bowl caliber form. Some bounce back moments here and there from Kendall Vildor and Kyler Gordon, who got beat at times, but also played well at times. We'll kind of circle through everything we saw from that side of the ball as well. But I think this Bears game once again showed that they can pretty much solely rely on their running game to carry them to victory, at least against teams like the Houston Texans and in week one against the San Francisco 49ers in a monsoon, right? This was a dominant performance from Khalil Herbert coming in after the David Montgomery injury, which obviously looked pretty bad on the field the way he got rolled up on. Head coach Matt Eberflus said after the game that they think Montgomery is, I think the word he used was, he's good. That doesn't mean he's not going to miss time, perhaps, but Eberflus called him day-to-day as they assess more what the extent of the injury will be. All they're saying right now is it is a lower leg injury. And I think we've seen enough from Khalil Herbert now to kind of know that, yes, we we love David Montgomery. We like the way he runs hard and physical and, and is such a, an engine of this offense and really a tone setter up front. However, the production does not drop off when Khalil Herbert is in the game. He is able to get runs downfield in a hurry. He's a little bit more north and south, a little bit more explosive, a little bit faster through the hole. It's it's just a different style of running that Herbert brings than Montgomery, but Herbert clearly able to be effective to the tune of eight yards per carry in a game when Your quarterback and your passing game collectively were not able to consistently move the ball through the air. And the defense tried to make it an emphasis point to stop the run. Now, this was a poor run defense, but I don't want that to take credit away from Khalil Herbert, who ran really, really well, made a guy miss tackles in open space, but also the offensive line doing a pretty good job more often than not giving him a hole to run through and letting him do the rest from there. There was also a big Jet sweep run by Equinemius St. Brown for 49 yards. And Justin Fields, even when the passing game was struggling a little bit, he had some nice scrambles in there, had a 29-yarder, took a couple of hits on those and looked like he got hurt on one of them and got checked out and back in the game. A little bit concerned about how that process played out there. But at least, you know, in that case, he's able to get things going in some way, shape, or form, get some kind of positive momentum moving the ball himself past the line of scrimmage. They ran the read option quite a bit, and I don't think Fields ever kept it. There were maybe at most one or two that he kept on on an actual true read option type play, but it wasn't like often that he was choosing not to hand the ball off and take it himself off the edge, but it is an aspect of this offense that we were seeing in the game. And of course, I don't want to overlook Treston Ebner, who got some extended carries in there as well. Didn't have the same production 
that Khalil Herbert did. But clearly, I think there's some confidence in the rookie to put him out there and, and give him a chance to run the ball and kind of put Herbert in the Montgomery role in the rotation. And then Ebner kind of got Herbert's spot in the rotation, except for after Ebner had that fumble, they kind of yanked him. And that was most of what we had seen from, from Tristan Ebner, even though he picked it up right away. So we'll definitely be keeping a close eye on what's going to happen with David Montgomery. And, and you know, if it's just a, a game or two type of thing, or if they put him on the short-term injured reserve, I'm sure is probably still a possibility, but it just sounds like based on the way that Matt Eberflus was talking, that they avoided, you know, season ending level stuff for as bad and as painful as, as that hit took for David Montgomery. But I think for the bears and the offense, right at this point, lean into it. You know, we know that the, the they haven't been able to pass the ball effectively. We know that, they haven't been able to pass the ball much. They just haven't been passing all that much. And I say, keep running then, right? right? Make other teams stop your ground game. You don't need to force passing plays if you're still able to win football games running this effectively. I think this this style of offense only works and you only are able to keep running this effectively if your defense is able to, you know, get a turnover or two like they did in this game or if, you know, the defense is able to keep you from falling behind on the scoreboard because, you know, if you're, if you're down a couple of scores, you're going to feel that need to pass. You don't, you don't want to kill too much time just running the clock. But if, but if you can stay either tied or with a lead or with a small deficit and you can stick to the running game, it's working. Like, it's, you, as much as it's a passing league now and you want to score more points and you want to be this, that, and the other, this is what you've got right now. And I say lean into it. Rely on the running game. Make it continue to be part of your focal point. It's good for the offensive line. It should be good for Justin Fields that, you know, he's able to have a good running game to rely on so he doesn't have to have, you know, a, a great game in order for this team to be able to climb back and win. That He can sit back and be a little bit more comfortable in his passing or at least try and get him back to a little bit more of that comfort and just say, yeah, hand the ball off to Khalil Herbert 20 times for 160 yards. Hard to Hard to argue much. Against that, and you know, if the running game has troubles at some point, cross that bridge when you get to it. But you don't have to preemptively say, "Okay, we got to stop running the ball so much because it's working." Like this, let's let's keep things rolling. And even if it's going to be low, ugly scoring games, that's still two and one right now, and you know, not what tied for first in the division. Still moving things forward. Not that we expect them to win the division, but that a win is still a win in football, and. It might, it doesn't seem like it's long-term sustainable, but it doesn't mean you have to stop doing it. Let's keep riding it out until you can't ride it out anymore. And let's, let's embrace the ground game again in Chicago, because how much time did we spend complaining about Matt Nagy abandoning the running game? Now we can enjoy watching the running game again, the way Chicago football is meant to be played physically between the tackles or stretching outside, but in the ground game, that's hardcore Chicago football. Eventually they're going to need their quarterback to play better. And it's a lot to be concerned about the way Justin Fields played in this game. He himself admitted he played like trash. We'll kind of go through what we saw from him, what we didn't see from him, and what what, what this kind of means for the team moving forward next on Locked On Bears. This episode of Locked On Bears is brought to you by our friends at Better Help. We're here to try and cut down on the stigma around mental health treatment, and our friends at Better Help are here to help you get the treatment you need. I'm personally someone who can partakes in online therapy just like this. I talk to a therapist every single week, and our friends at BetterHelp are here to help you find the right match for you. BetterHelp makes it convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You get matched with a therapist, you fill out a brief little survey, and then you can switch therapists at any time either. Because sometimes the first person you with, you meet with isn't always the perfect fit for you, but BetterHelp helps you find that right person to help you work through your mental health challenges. Everyone has mental health challenges. You don't have to be in a crisis to seek better help. Just like you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be injured to take good care of your body. You don't have to be in a mental health crisis to take care of your mind and BetterHelp is here to help. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash locked on. The Chicago Bears are going to need a better Justin Fields to 
can sustain the type of offensive success that they're looking for. Because, you know, through the first couple of games, it was easy to, you know, to find, I don't want to use the word, explanations, explanations for the lack of production, right? Week one against the 49ers, Monsoon, neither team could really pass the ball in that game, willing to pretty well chalk that up to weather and also first game in a brand new offense with brand new receivers. Second game against the Packers, you only throw 11 to, or only throw 11 passes, completes seven of those, and the interception was kind of garbage time. So that just felt more like a, a volume thing. He wasn't making bad decisions. He just wasn't really getting opportunities to throw the ball downfield. But this was the first game where it felt like it was at least the best set of circumstances he's had yet this season to have success throwing the ball, and he looked the worst he has across all three games throwing the ball. You know, both interceptions were just bad passes. And even on plays that weren't intercepted, there were just bad, inaccurate passes where he has an open receiver. And there was this missed swing pass to Ebner out of the backfield. There was a rollout to Tongas that he just threw high in behind him. Of course, Cole Komet's interception was overthrown. Darnell Mooney's interception was overthrown into triple coverage. And it just, for whatever reason, Fields was not operating well, was not firing in all cylinders, was not calm, cool, collected, confident, and just not seeing the field super well either. Because, you know, like I'm, I'm very curious to watch the all 22 of this game. And that's what we're going to talk about on tomorrow's podcast. I'll go through the, the film, watch all the receivers on the play to see our guys open, what's Fields seeing when he's not throwing these passes. But it felt to me on the first watch through that the majority of the time, or at least enough of the time, the offensive line was giving him time to throw. But quite often, the pressure would come, you know, three, three and a half seconds into a play, which sounds fast, but on average in the NFL, that's that's pretty darn good. Most pass plays are come out in about two and a half to, or less seconds. And, you know, it's like he's in the pocket, he's looking, he's looking, he's looking. He's not finding anything. And in the first two games, we've seen that there have been open receivers. It's just a matter of him seeing them, getting through his progression, getting to the open receiver, registering that they're open while they're still open because they're not open the whole play necessarily, but it's about the timing and the delivery off of that. And Fields doesn't seem confident in, you know, seeing it and throwing it and, you know, believing that it's open, trusting that it's open and firing it in there that he can get it when it's open. And then in this game, even being accurate enough to hit the receiver when they were open. And it's weird because Fields doesn't typically have those kinds of major accuracy issues. And I, I can't wait to rewatch and see, you know, his footwork and his mechanics on those throws. If that was part of why it sails to Cole Komet or Darnell Mooney. I mean, obviously quarterbacking is hard and it's hard to throw downfield accurately, but we've seen Fields be an accurate downfield passer, especially like that. That's one of his strengths. And the fact that he was struggling with one of his strengths in this game is why it was so concerning. And maybe that's a reason to think it was a little bit more of a fluke, but it's been three straight games of not great passing overall. And that's why it's hard to just write this one off as a fluke because it was sort of like, okay, we can kind of explain week one, we can kind of explain week two, but we can't just keep explaining away poor passing production from this Bears offense, right? Like eventually it's just got to happen and the the excuses or the reasons or the explanations, you have to still overcome those and still be better than those. And this game is not one that really has a good explanation for it. He, he was bad. And that's, that's a real, real problem for this Bears team because this Texans defense was going to be kind of the game for him to get things rolling a little bit more, right? Not that he was going to go off for five touchdowns and 500 yards, but we have seen this Texans defense give up a ton of yards in week one to, to what was it, Matt Ryan and the Indianapolis Colts had 350 yards passing through the air and Michael Pittman had a big game. And then uh, last week against the Denver Broncos, well, the Broncos have kind of had their own struggles themselves, but Russell Wilson still had, you know, 200 yards and a touchdown in there. It wasn't, he wasn't great, but Cortland Sutton as a receiver had seven catches for 122 yards and they went after some of the Texans, you know, cornerbacks in particular. And it didn't result in a ton of points and I wasn't expecting a ton of points from the Bears, but I just thought it would look easier for Fields. We talked on the, the Game Plan podcast on Friday about how coverage-wise, 
there were supposed to be opportunities to take some shots against this Texans defense. That's why I think the All-22 film is really going to tell me a lot because I, I think there were opportunities there in this game that we just we just couldn't see. And for some reason, Fields wasn't firing often and he, he was then holding onto the ball too long and then he would be under pressure. And that's when I feel like, yes, you're going to see the pressure numbers and Fields was probably under pressure on 50 plus percent of his passes in this game. But the offensive line, for the most part, was doing its job. There were definitely a couple of plays when the pressure was way too quick in Fields' face and he got sacked on a couple of those and threw the ball away on a couple of those. It was not perfect offensive line play. You're never going to get perfect offensive line play. And a rewatch will give you a better sense of how how good the offensive line was. But I felt like the pass protection was good enough. It wasn't great, but good enough that I feel like it was enough that Fields should have been able to do more. And I, I, like, I don't come away from this game saying, oh man, the offensive line was so bad. That's why Justin Fields couldn't throw. Because I really think he was holding onto the ball too long and showing, again, some struggles in pocket presence that have been present throughout his career up to this point and things he's working on developing. The one thing I would say, as if you want to find a silver lining from Justin Fields' performance here, I don't think, certainly neither of the interceptions, and just sort of having watched it live, I don't think any of Justin Fields' passes were poor decisions. I'll put an asterisk on that that it's possible I'm not remembering one or two that was just sort of safely, you know, incomplete or whatever. But like, from what I can remember, certainly neither interception and the incomplete passes, it wasn't like, oh my goodness, he misread the coverage. What is he doing? Why is he trying to throw the ball there, right? The interception to commit and Mooney, a, a, an accurate pass, I think, is caught both times. Cole Komet, especially, was very, very open. Mooney, I mean, it looks like triple coverage, but it was it was covered too. So there's two deep safeties, and then the middle linebacker's trying to run deep. He, he has Mooney running with the middle linebacker. It, it becomes triple coverage because he sailed the ball too much, too much air under it. There wasn't enough sort of velocity behind it. But if you fire it in there, that's where you like going on that play. You want linebacker inside player versus Mooney going vertical between two safeties that each have a half the field to be responsible for. I don't think that was inherently the poor decision. It was the throw, the actual delivery of the ball, but not the between the ears and the eyes, you know, seeing where the coverage should be and what throw he should make on that coverage. I would say like, there's a difference when if he's not seeing the field done, you know, well on the plays that he held the ball too long, maybe that's poor decision-making, but he wasn't his decision making wasn't reckless. It is probably the most concise way to say it. It wasn't always great on the plays that he didn't pull the trigger, but he wasn't putting the ball into harm's way with the decision making. The ball went into harm's way with the delivery and the throw itself, but not the idea of the throw. And I think that counts for something, right? It's not Mitch Trubisky, oh my God, why did he throw the ball to that guy? It's not Jay Cutler, why is he trying to fire those passes in there and to be too confident in his arm? It's this ball did not go where it was supposed to, and he's not being decisive enough and quick enough on those decisions to throw the ball, which is a big problem, but a different problem than can't tell what the coverage is and where he should go with the ball when he does. We'll see what the All-22 film brings us for some more specific answers on what exactly was going wrong on tomorrow's podcast. But we still need to talk about this Bears defense and the way they stepped up in this game, generated the big turnovers when it was needed the most, and helped... The Bears win despite not having the best quarterback play. We'll look at the resurgence of Roquan Smith, the turnover generated, and some of the bounce back moments from these young cornerbacks next on Locked on Bears. I got to be honest, when the inactives came out and Jalen Johnson was not playing in this game, I was worried about how well this Bears defense would be able to hold up. Not that Davis Mills scares you, but... We've seen Kyler Gordon struggle at times this season. We've seen Kendall Vildor struggle at times this season. And of course, the absence of Jalen Johnson meant that a different Jalen, Jalen Jones, started on the outside. An undrafted rookie free agent gets the start in week three. And I was concerned a little bit, just sort of on, on my own, personally at home, watching the game, like, oh man, are they going to be able to keep Brandon Cooks covered? And we saw early on the Bears, the, the Texans went after Kendall Vildor a couple times. He gave up some, some not... Not great catches, and Kyler Gordon gave up one over the middle, but I thought they both did a pretty good job recovering. You know, that they both had their ups and downs, but Vildor was the one who was all over that that goal line tipped 
interception. He was he read it all the way when Brandon Cooks got in front of him, popped it up. Eddie Jackson deserves a ton of credit for coming down with that one. And Eddie Jackson continues to play well and have a bounce back season himself. And there was another pass breakup later on where Vildor's all over Brandon Cooks on a comeback route. I think some of that was Davis Mills' timing was a little bit late on those throws and some and like later in the game, his timing was just off more and more and it allowed Vildor to recover, but not every cornerback is able to still recover in those ways, especially after got having been beaten earlier in the game. And with Kyler Gordon, right, we I think we all remember the one big like 50-yard completion he gave up, you know, deep crossing right over the middle. And they showed the all 22 replay. Bears are in cover one. Robert, safety's coming down underneath, single deep safety back. Vildor's or I mean Gordon's man coverage across the field. But the Bears run this adjustment often in cover one where if you have a crossing route, a deep crossing route over the middle of the field, you pass that crossing route off. So that when the safety comes down, there the safety is supposed to pick up that route, and then whoever was in man coverage takes over where the safety was in the robber underneath zone on cover one. So Gordon is following the, the receiver across the middle of the field and then stops to drop off into the safety zone, but then the safety never, and I, I didn't see which safety it was, but the safety never picked up the crosser to keep going with them. So then Gordon is like, well, crap, I got to I get, somebody's got to get over there. So he tries to get back over there. And then it looks like he was the one who just was torched in coverage, but he was expecting <clears throat> one of the other safeties to pick up that route. And they didn't, I and mean, we don't know whether Gordon was right or the safety was right. You know, I think it's a, there's a specific call they make on the field on whether you're going to pass that off or not. It was not communicated properly. But again, I think that's the way to say it is that, it looks bad for Gordon, but it's more a communication issue than Gordon was bad in coverage because he was doing what he thought he was supposed to be doing on the play, and the safety thought that they were supposed to be doing what they were supposed to do on the play. I tend to think Gordon was probably correct in not letting in in not staying with the crosser and trying to pass that off. I think that's what the Bears want to do to keep that route from being so difficult to cover. So I think the underneath safety was wrong. I don't know if the safety just didn't see the crossing route and didn't know to pick it up. Or didn't think that adjustment was in play, but I, I tend to not think that was really fully Gordon's fault on that adjustment. But we'll we'll go back through the all twenty two on that one to be sure. Otherwise, defensively, I mean, what a game for Roquan Smith. I've been a, a, a vocal Roquan Smith critic at times because I think we want to make Roquan Smith the highest paid linebacker in the NFL. Then we should hold him to that standard of looking like the best linebacker in the NFL. And this game against the Texans was a lot more in line with that. He looked a lot more comfortable, a lot more confident, a lot more decisive, flowing downhill to get to the ball carrier instead of floating over the top of blocks. You know, there were three or four plays where he knifes through the line of scrimmage in the backfield for a tackle for loss. And of course, the interception in the fourth quarter was huge. Step read it the whole way. And it was really quick, like, because Mills was looking off the linebacker. I mean, he's looking right the whole time, turns, looks, and throws left in a fairly swift motion of eyes to, to turn to throw right away. But Roquan Smith was ready for it because he saw, he saw the route and then was looking back at the quarterback. So he knew that as soon as the quarterback turns, that's the route he needs to bite on, stepped in front and looked, I mean, just a great interception, a great play, great instincts. He's playing more instinctual now and getting downhill and being able to be aggressive again. And that's what helps make Roquan Smith his best. I thought that that came up incredibly clutch and is really fitting more and more like the Roquan Smith we thought we were getting this season. I thought Nick Morrow played pretty well again also. A couple of nice plays in coverage, blew up that screen pass towards the end there. I think that was in the fourth quarter as well. You know, still... Gets blocked down in run defense sometimes, but like it felt like progress from those linebackers in particular. And I'm trying not to put too much stock into what they did against the Texans because the Texans are a winless football team and a football team that has not played particularly well this season. And the Bears are going to play some teams that are significantly better at some point. But the schedule from here is, I don't want to say light, but it is a bunch of teams that you're not sure if they're good or not. I mean, the Giants are 2 0 heading into Monday Night Football, but. I don't get a sense that they were like particularly dominant and, you know, they still feel like a, a beatable type of two. And we'll see how they do against the Cowboys, but like they beat the Titans and the Panthers in games that just were not super impressive. And then the Vikings looked beatable for a while. They're against the Lions and pulled out that one. That'll be the, and so that, that'll that be a, a tough game. I'm not trying to say the Vikings are not good. I'm just saying we're still figuring out how good the Minnesota Vikings are. The commanders, we don't know if they're very good. The Patriots, 
Mac Jones' injury, we're not sure if they're very good. You know, then the Cowboys, if Dak Prescott's there or not, will be interesting. The Dolphins after that. The Bears have this really funky schedule from here where week in and week out, we're not sure yet how good each of the opponents are. But no one on that list is like a guaranteed Super Bowl team just yet until you get later in the season when you play the, the Bills and, and the Eagles are going to look like they're going to be really tough. But for now, the Bears are in this interesting stretch where if they can keep playing really good defense and keep running the ball, I, I think they're going to be in a lot of these games, even if Justin Fields is still working through a lot of these potential struggles. We'll certainly break each and every one of these matchups down for you every week here on the Locked On Bears podcast. So make sure you hit that subscribe button to keep up with all of our daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. Thanks for making the Locked On Bears podcast your first listen today and hopefully every day. If you're looking for your second listen, the Locked On Podcast Network is your team every day. We've got your Chicago sports teams covered. Locked On Bulls, Locked On Cubs, Locked On White Sox, Locked On Northwestern Wildcats, Locked On Fighting Illini, Locked On Blackhawks, don't want to skip them. I mean, across across the area. Or if you're not a, a Chicago area sports fan, but still a Bears fan and want to check out, I mean, we've got every college football, or not every college football team, but a lot of the Power 5 college teams, but every baseball, basketball, and hockey team, we've got them covered as well here in the Lockdown Podcast Network. So check those out. Come on back for Locked on Bears tomorrow. When we break down the All-22 film. And come on back for that next opportunity to bear down.